Welcome everyone to day two of HashiConf Europe 2022. Um, my name is Vinod Murlidhar. I'm a senior director of product management at HashiCorp. I own the product and roadmap direction for both the Vault and Boundary products. I'm going to be specifically talking about the Vault product here today um, and we'll talk about some of the updates, things that we've been doing, doing over the last few months, as well as give a little glimpse into the future of what, what we're about to do as well. I would also highly recommend and urge you to attend the Boundary talk that's going to happen at 1045 in the Vester Uni, which is on the other um, room on the other side of the hallway. Uh, and obviously, if you've been in the keynote, you heard of some of the exciting announcements that we had from HCP Boundary going beta as well. Um, first of all, I wanted to start off by talking about something that's a little grim, right? $10.5 trillion. That is the annual cost of cybercrime by the year 2025. If you think about it, that's the size of a GDP of a really large country, right? And the reason that this, this is uh, such a big uh, impact on the global economies and organizations like yourself is that not only is there financial and economic kind of impact when there's a cyber crime, but also the loss of kind of trust and reputation that you and your organization suffers with your customers and the people that use your products causes this impact, um, negative impact to your business. And so it's not surprising that when you ask business leaders, the number one concern for them is cybersecurity. And that is over kind of new competitors or recession or all those other things that are important to them. I wanted to also give you another snippet of information, another glimpse of information here. In the last 10 years, there were 20 companies that had some form of uh, massive data breach in the tune of $1 million or above. And 95% of those companies now use Vault. What does that go on to say? And, and the fact that all of you are here wanting to learn and understand about Vault and our products uh, that HashiCorp offers goes to show that the importance that you place on kind of securing your infrastructure and making it um, kind of uh, providing that trust to your end customers as well. And why is this important now? In the past, securing a data center was definitely not easy, but it was certainly simpler. Right? You, you probably heard Armand talk about this in the keynote a little bit as well. Um, your data center and the infrastructure was inside the four walls, where anything outside of the four walls is untrusted, is uh, insecure, and everything that was inside the data center was considered to be secure and trusted. And that's not the case anymore especially now that your organizations have started using infrastructure that are not within the four walls or the boundaries of, of your infrastructure or your data center. Um, most of you here, I've spoken to a lot of you over the last couple of days uh, from the dinners on, on the uh, Monday night to uh, at the booth on, on Tuesday. Many of you ha are well into your cloud journeys and your organizations are starting to move towards the cloud. So many of you have both um, uh, on-prem infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, and in many cases, hybrid and multi-cloud infrastructure as well. And what does that mean when now you don't have that boundary of that wall to secure your infrastructure? It means that now there is no trust between pieces of infrastructure that, that you uh, have to build uh, for building your applications and deploying your applications. And very often, this is kind of the, the image that we like to use, is your infrastructure is now spread across these different cloud providers. And application development is no longer monolithic as well. There's not a single application. You're actually stitching together a lot of different applications. So if you, you may be using Stripe for your credit card information, Twilio for email integration. There's, there's a lot of application development today is basically a collection of a lot of microservices that you have to integrate with as well. And that prompts the need for authentication and authorization between these services. And that's what we're calling as the machine-to-machine -machine authentication and authorization problem. And when organizations start to do that, what ends up again happening is the problem that we're calling as the secret sprawl. 
and these secrets start to end up in places where they're not supposed to be. Right? And, and this could be in source code. Um, we've had numerous examples of organizations where kind of your API key is uh, embedded into your, your source code, is up on GitHub. It could be um, username, passwords that are written into plain text config files. These are all examples of things that, again, developers don't want to build uh, an insecure application, but they want to build something that's simple and easy, and kind of um, that, that's the simplest and easiest way that they start with. But the problem just becomes bigger as you scale and grow these applications. Walt's approach to solve this problem is very simple. Right? And again, if you were in the keynote, uh, uh, Armand did a great job explaining the concept of Walt itself. What, what, what I have here is, again, Walt is built upon the notion of zero trust with identity at the center and, uh, of its core. Right? In this example, there's a client that is trying to access this system. The client could be a human user, but in most cases, this is an application. Right? And this is, in, let's say, in this case, the client is a web server that is trying to access this system, which is a database. And for this example, let's again pick Postgres as that database. And, and if that Postgres is running on one of the cloud providers, it could be running on your on-prem infrastructure. Walt starts off by authenticating this client with an identity provider that you bring. So it could be um, AWS IAM, GCP IAM, Azure AD. It could be Okta, whatever your organization has already kind of built upon as its um, source of trust and identity provider. You can use that as the authentication mechanism to authenticate to Walt. And from there, uh, the, the core use case of Walt is Walt being used as a secret store, right? So let's say you have a username, password for this Postgres database. You would store that on Walt, and as soon as you've authenticated yourself on uh, Walt using that ID provider, Walt will then go look up and say, hey, this is user one. Therefore, they have access to this Postgres database DB1, and that policy is built into Walt itself. And that authorization mechanism on Walt is a very robust uh, mechanism allowing you to set policies that are very, very fine-grained. And once client now has access to this system, you can re retrieve these secrets that allow you access to this. But one of the, the advantages of using a system like Walt is that because this is consolidated and centralized now, you can revoke those secrets, you can set time to live policies for those secrets, allowing you to manage those secrets really well. And that's only the starting point, right? Walt is, like I said, the secrets management, using Walt as a secret store is usually how customers start on their journey with Walt, but very often they move into building dynamic credentials, which means that the client comes onto Walt and says, hey, I want access to this Postgres DB1, and a credential is created on the fly, right? So there's a credential that is created, a username or a password or whatever it is, uh, the mechanism to gain access to that system is created on the fly and again maintained and managed by Walt. So it can be revoked, all of that happens on the fly as well. And beyond that, there's other use cases, again, in the journey of customers starting to use Walt. They start with static secrets, moving into dynamic secrets, and then they go on to work on kind of use cases like PKI, which, again, Walt can serve as both an intermediate and root CA. So we'll be talking about a lot of innovation that we've been doing in there as well. Uh, Walt can also act as a, a key management um, solution. So we have a lot of, again, innovation, both in providing key management solutions with your cloud KMS providers, where we do root of trust key management, or working with your on-prem infrastructure that uses only the KMIP protocol for key management. So again, a lot of innovation in um, these additional use cases that Walt has built over the years. And I wanted to kind of, I think Armand mentioned 10 million in his talk today, so his information is definitely more accurate and, and uh, more up to date than mine is. Um, 8.8 .8 million Kubernetes and Walt downloads in one year, uh, 131 million open source downloads a year, and trillions of secrets served, right? And, and what does this go to say, right? Really is that Walt's adoption has continued to and uh, we, we've continued to scale and grow Walt's adoption over the period of time. And a large part of that is because of 
and the community's contribution to continue to build. Um, so it's not just Walt and the Walt engineers building uh, Walt functionality, but also the open source community that contributes, our partners that have contributed to kind of the, the increased usage and success of Walt itself. Lastly, this stat just talks about 70% of the top US banks using Walt. And why is this important, right? It is important because these organizations place a very high amount of kind of, um, they, they think of security as one of the top, uh, top reasons why Walt is being considered for those use cases. And being able to serve that means that we take on a responsibility of these mission critical apps within these large organizations. The example here is of the US banks, but I, I want to say that within Europe as well, we've been very, very successful with large financial services organizations, among others. And Walt started off its journey as an open source product, just like you saw Boundary today. We started kind of offering a commercial um, offering with Walt Enterprise. Uh, in fact, I spoke to someone at the booth yesterday where they said they are still using Walt open source, but now they have multiple teams, and they've started kind of seeing some of the pain points of managing multiple teams and organizations within that. And that's where our Walt Enterprise comes in that allows you to build more governance and policy management. So building things like carving out namespaces that allows sub-teams within your organization to have your own policy mechanisms, your own use cases be served by Walt, and be able to kind of um, uh, use that in, in a, in, within the same confines of the, the Walt cluster itself. It also helps with multi-data center and scale, so being able to use your same Walt cluster replicated up across multiple environments. Uh, allows you to do uh, performance replication. So if you have uh, a cluster that runs in the UK and another cluster that runs in a different location in, the, in Europe, and you have applications that are kind of served by those, you can reduce the latency, improve performance by using our performance replication, which again is part of the Walt Enterprise capabilities. And what we've seen over the last, so Walt uh, in open source was introduced in 2015, and we went to Walt Enterprise about 2018, and in the last four years, what we've seen is that Walt's usage has scaled with our customers. Today, we have customers kind of running hundreds of thousands of uh, Kubernetes pods with applications, and Walt being kind of serving their secrets management needs there. But what if I want to manage, what if I want to use Walt in scale without having to manage Walt itself? And this is where, if I had my way, there would be angels singing, and that's the cue for kind of HCP Walt is a way that we bring all the power of Walt without any of the operational overheads of having to manage Walt for you. I have a big section on HCP Walt itself, so I'll talk a little bit more in detail there. So what, what I want to take away from all of that introduction and, and what, how customers are using Walt is that one, it is both very widely adopted. Yeah, we, we saw the hundreds of millions of OSS downloads. Whether or not they're HashiCorp paid customers, there is a lot of folks who run their production workloads on Walt because they trust Walt to be their secrets management solution. But we also, over the last four years, have grown with our customers deeply integrated in their environments, kind of whether it's OpenShift or Kubernetes, Wherever they are, whether on the cloud or on-prem, bare metal infrastructure, Walt has been able to kind of deeply integrate into those customer environments at scale. And so when we go build a, a roadmap, right, so as product managers and engineers, when we have to go build the roadmap, it's important for us to have, hey, here's the reason why we want to um, kind of bring these things to our customers and our practitioners. And so I'll, I'll break down our roadmap and product direction into themes, and I'll talk through them. I have six themes, and I have six 15 minutes left, as I can see on this really big timer right here. Um, so I'll try and go as fast as I can. I do want to say that everything I'm going to be talking here is only a snippet, is only a small subset of the, the product roadmap that and the product uh, features and capability, capabilities we've delivered over the last few months. Definitely should go take a look at our um, online uh, information portals, whether it's our Learn platform, the developer platform, which Armand talked about yesterday, for more of the details. 
So we'll start with secrets management and security. Again, we talked about how 70% of the banks in the US, uh, the top 20 banks in the US are trusting Vault to do secrets management for them. And so for us, um, best-in-class security is something that we, we take seriously as a responsibility. The 2020 Gartner PAM report, for example, called Vault as a best-in-class secrets management solution. And that's because we take uh, the responsibility of security very, very seriously, which means that kind of our, our cryptography and other operations that are kind of hard for uh, developers to kind of, um, if you are to build your own cryptography, do your own key management or do your own secrets management, that is a hard problem to solve, and we want to take on that responsibility for you. So I'm glad to announce that in uh, over the last few months, we have worked on a new version of the Vault binary that is now FIPS 140-2 compliant. For those who are not aware, FIPS is a, a, a standards body uh, that awards certifications to cryptography programs. And particularly if you, have, if you are either public sector customers or pro public sector companies, or you have customers who are public sector, this is something that they want to see. Um, this may not be fully relevant in the context of, kind of Europe and uh, the standards and regulations there, but this is what gives trust to your end customers that says the, the cryptography that's used in Vault is of the highest standards. And what's next? We are working on the FIPS 140-3 standard, which was just introduced, and they've started validating as of September last year. So that's going to be really important for us to continue to not only be the best secrets management solution with the highest levels of cryptography, but for you to be able to convince your customers, your end clients, if you're a platform team within a company, be able to convince your application teams if you're running a, a, a business that works with public sector or government or financial services customers, to be able to tell them that you're using solutions that have the highest level of standards uh, available. Vault Open Source started um, kind of the our journey with, with a firm focus on the developer experience. We're entirely API first. We start off by thinking about how developers are going to adopt our product. And even again, in, in the booth yesterday, it was great to meet a lot of developers who, who started off kind of like even in these larger organizations, Walt's adoption was started with developers starting our products first, right? And then eventually, our sales teams and others being able to kind of convince that scale and other requirements need you to become a paid customer. So for us, it's always developer first, making sure that developers are continuing to find, as we continue to build all of these features into Vault, to be simple and easy to use as well. And yeah, so making Vault simple and easy to try, adopt, and take to production in, in different environments is something that we take very, very seriously. Um, over the last few months, we worked on a new set of uh, reference apps called the Hello Vault reference apps. These are available in multiple languages, particularly if you are interested in running a proof of concept with Vault, you can go check out these reference apps that is self-contained largely, uh, has uh, examples to allow you to do static secrets management as well as dynamic credentials with the, a new set of apps that are available. And again, available in multiple languages, so definitely go take a look at that as well. Our Glo Go client library is one of the two supported client libraries that were written by HashiCorp. We have a whole bunch of other cli client libraries and SDKs that have been developed by the community. Uh, but one of the things that customers have been and practitioners have been asking us about was, hey, authenticating to Vault in the first place with our application requires a, a bunch of manual steps. So we've now included a new login method to help support authentication into Vault as part of that Go Client library as well. Um, we also have set up a, a whole bunch of quick start guides with setup examples in all of these different languages. So again, continuing that down the path of, hey, not all developers are the same. You have different languages, you have different environments, and so trying to help you on that first step towards Vault adoption, that's something that we've been working on as well. And so what's, what's coming up next? 
Um, the two libraries that I talked about, the, the Go and Ruby libraries that we developed, are uh, things that are deeply embedded within Vault's um, repo on GitHub itself. We only update that once every four months as part of our release. And we wanted to go and make that change where we're offering not only those libraries, um, kind of, uh, and, and over the years we've seen that as the APIs have evolved, the libraries have not kept up with those, um, those, um, the, the, those updates. And being able to now use open API-based client libraries, which will allow any new changes in the Vault API to automatically get uh, a library update and that also allows for us to not be doing that in a four-month cadence, but release these libraries much, much faster as well. And if you've used Vault, you probably also know about our um, secret store. The KB secret store has a version one and version two, and there's a slight difference in uh, the path. When if we use KV v2, there's an additional um, data folder within uh, that you'd have to use in, in all of your API calls. And we're now building a KV helper method that will help kind of customers have a single user experience. Uh, practitioners and developers have a single user experience if you're using KV v1 or v2. These are, again, like I said, very, very small subset of all the improvements that we're making to make our developers' life simpler and easier, especially as they try and understand what. Um, the next big bucket of work is uh, our ecosystem. Again, Vault's ecosystem is, is largely driven by development that we do, but also our practitioners, our community, as well as our partners who continue to build that ecosystem that allows us to seamlessly integrate Vault into different environments. Again, Armand talked about it today. Um, Vault is run in entirely on-prem infrastructure that works with legacy softwares, traditional softwares. Vault is run on clouds. Vault is run in Kubernetes environments. So being able to continuously provide that infrastructure and ecosystem integration is, is really important to us. Uh, last year in HashiConf US, we announced that Vault had 100 partner integrations that, that we launched. And this is kind of us showing that we, we are going down that line of continuing to build those integrations. I've kind of broken down um, the ecosystem pieces into three buckets. I call it one, the on-prem. You can see continuing support for like database and um, TDE or transparent data encryption for MS SQL. You can see there Oracle, Postgres, building web UIs for that and being able to do dynamic credentials for IBM DB2, which is kind of host login based. Uh, is something that we've introduced in the last couple of releases. We also continue to build things with our cloud infrastructure. Um, I talked about the key management secrets engine earlier uh, when I was talking about the ecosystem. Um, key management secrets engine allows for you to uh, store your root of trust. So if you're using Azure KMS or AWS KMS or GCP KMS, being able to use um, your root key and bring that to Vault to be maintained is, is a security policy that most organizations have. We introduced the Snowflake Secrets Engine a couple of quarters ago, and we've now added Key Pair, which is being able to use a public key and, and a private key combination to authenticate into um, Snowflake as well. We also heard Armand talk a little bit about this today. Walt can serve as an OIDC provider, so we're kind of continuing to uh, put a lot of focus and emphasis on that. Um, we just launched the Kubernetes uh, Dynamic Secrets Engine yesterday as part of Walt 111 that went out live yesterday. This allows you to create service credentials on the fly for Kubernetes in order to deploy your applications as well. And there's a whole bunch coming in all of these buckets, right? Like we're continuing to build uh, improvements into uh, but the on-prem, cloud, as well as building the infrastructure improvements for all of the cloud ones as well. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about uh, these other use cases that we talked about, primarily um, kind of the PKI use case that we have. So Vault can serve as both uh, intermediate and root CA. And within that, customers with kind of particular conservative risk profiles require that the keys be created in a hardware security module or HSM. And that's hard because customer, the developers who are writing the applications will have to understand how to integrate with an HSM. And 
in Vault 111, a kind of feed, uh, the release that went out, we now allow uh, Vault to offload select PKI operations like key generation and certificate signing to be done on HSM. So your developer is still kind of uh, calling Vault APIs for PKI operation, but Vault in the background is going and getting the key generation and certificate signing done at, at AHS, HSM itself. Also talk to you a little bit about Vault scaling with our customers. I talked about customers who have um, 10, 20, 30 clusters in different regions. We have customers who are using millions of IOPS and operations with Vault every second. And we also have customers who are, again, using 100,000 pods of Kubernetes. And, and this means that we need to continue to maintain high levels of performance, reliability, scale, for, for these customers. Um, especially if you're running Vault in your infrastructure, you're, you're thinking about setup and configuration, being able to monitor and manage Vault. And so we've kind of continued our investments by um, integrated storage, which was um, kind of prior to us introducing that, you had to use Vault with a console cluster as a backend storage. Now, over the last year and a half, we've invested in providing an integrated storage within Vault that allows you to use Vault without the need for an external storage. And we're kind of glad to announce that this is one of the, the primary ways that Vault customers are currently using Vault um, as, as for their storage. Vault agent telemetry. So a Vault agent is one of the ways Vault customers deploy um, their applications. And a telemetry was an important piece that was missing. This, again, is a community contribution, something that the community has contributed. Uh, and we picked this up. Allows for you to understand the health of the Vault agent. That's something that we worked on. And finally, kind of a management of the Vault cluster. Even if um, kind of Vault is up and running and you're able to monitor it, there's a lot of additional overhead that's involved in management. We introduced resource quotas that allows for you to set rate limits. It allows for you to set lease count limits so that a single application does not take on the resources of the entire Vault cluster bringing it down. Right? And we have introduced other kind of uh, management and administration capabilities over the last couple of releases as well. Um, and continuing with what next, we are working on autopilot capabilities. So a console, if you, you are familiar with our console backend storage that does things like automated upgrades, redundancy zones, those are all things that we're, we're going to work on um, on the integrated storage side as well. With this last capability, we, we think that um, integrated storage will be on par with the console backend storage. And you, you have two choices for how you want to deploy and use your vault itself. Uh, we're also working on a whole bunch of perf improvements and improvements in our client count attribution, especially as a client, as we refer to, is an app that integrates with vault. And being able to attribute it to different namespaces, different mounts, we're con continuing down that path of providing you kind of um, information on how to go do internal billing, for example, on uh, how Vault is used within your environments. We also are improving our resource code, as I talked about rate limiting and leases. We're adding other parameters that allow you to improve um, resource quota usage as well. Brings us to kind of the last section, which is HCP um, Vault. We launched HCP Vault in April of last year. Um, we introduced a standards queue as part of the launch. And then in August, we um, released a starter queue that allows you to focus on smaller projects. Again, a smaller sized uh, HCP Vault instance with some restrictions on the number of applications that can be deployed on it. And in March of this year, we launched the Plus Q with a focus on enterprise. And what that really means is that Vault, HCP Vault now has performance replication that allows you to set up HCP Vault over uh, multiple geos. We have enabled and turned on multi-factor authentication on actually all SKUs of HCP Vault. And when we first launched HCP Vault, we only supported five of the primary auth providers and secrets engines. Now we support up to 40, right? So we've been working really hard, kind of continue, continuing to make HCP Vault as that product available for, um, 
for, for uh, your enterprise use cases. We're continuing to build upon AWS region support. We already support a whole bunch of regions in, in um, the Europe region and Asia Pacific. We're going to fill out the rest of the regions over the next few months and then kind of focus on making HCP Vault to be a multi-cloud one as well. Right now, it's only supported on AWS. We're working on other cloud providers as we speak. And hopefully, by the time we get here next year, we'll have a lot of, um, a lot of updates there. We're also working on ways to improve our migration story. Folks who already are using our open source, our enterprise, and want to get to HCP Vault, we're working on some of those improvements to migrate into HCP Vault. Last piece there, and that's kind of the end of my presentation, is what we're calling as value-add services. Value-add services are, there were things that we wanted to do with Vault that was not possible because we did not run, maintain, manage Vault. But now, because HCP Vault allows us access to some of this information, we're able to run some additional analytics and things like that that will be introduced as part of HCP Vault itself. I'm uh, not able to share more details on that, uh, but if you are a, a paid customer and you have an NDA with us, I'm happy to talk to you at the booth after this as well. That's all I had for all of you today. Thank you so much for your time. I know it's a, it's a busy, busy day for you, so thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.